all for joining us this morning. My name is Ala Iofi. For those of you who don't know me, I'm the executive director of this fine club. Um, if you have a good time with us today and you're interested in how you might be able to get involved going forward, please come find me after the event. I'm around. I'm very nice. Just come talk to me and I'll give you all the information that you need. Um, so it's my honor this morning to, to introduce our guest today. We have Jim Powers, the CEO of Crow Morwath LLP a public accounting, consulting, and technology firm with offices around the world with over 3,600 employees. Jim's been with the company for almost 40 years. And in that time, the company has transformed from a tiny firm in Northern Indiana to a national enterprise that's globally branded. It's been recognized by Fortune Magazine as, and I'm gonna take a deep breath to get through this, one of the best places to work in consulting and professional services, one of the best 100 places to work for women, one of the 50 best places to work for recent college grads, one of the 100 best places to work for millennials, one of the 50 best workplaces for parents, and one of the best workplaces for giving back, which is very timely in the season of giving. So I was going to say, join me in welcoming Jim, but I think you already did that, so I'll just let you guys get started. Enjoy. Jim, it is great to have you with us this morning. Thanks for getting up early and coming over here. How about um, Eastern time? It isn't that early. You're okay. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Um, you know, our experience in these conversations we've had on this platform over the years um, has often shown us that, that the person a leader becomes begins very, very early in life with sort of key influencers that, that shape them. And uh, I know you had a uh, you had a, a storied basketball career, and I hope we'll actually hear a little bit about that. But um, tell us about the coach, that sort of role model and mentor that uh, was of a particular shaping influence on your life early. Well, athletics were a big part of my life when I was growing up. You know, I spent my free time as a kid at the Y, and at uh, the park and in summer basketball leagues and doing all of those things. So I've been on hundreds and hundreds of teams and that's what really has shaped, I think, a lot of my views about you know, leadership and about how things work. And you know, I've been on very, very good teams and I've also been on some bad teams. And you, know, you learn from both. And I, and I sort of have, and so that idea of the, of the coach has really always appealed to me. You know, when I, was, when I was getting ready to go into college, I told my father, who was my uh, coach throughout my career, uh, at least through high school, that I wanted to be a teacher and a coach. And he said to me, he said, I didn't work that hard so that you could become a teacher, which was in some ways unfortunate, because I really respect and love both my parents who are teachers. Uh, I really respect and, and appreciate and love teachers and what they've done for my children and now my grandchildren is really, really awesome. His point, though, was a good one, but I would suggest back to him today that a lot of what I'm doing as a CEO today is I'm, just co I'm coaching just like he did. Instead of 12 people on a team, I've got 3,600, but it's really no different. And frankly, of the 3,600, most of them, if you divided them up, would be in 12 or 15 person teams. Yeah. So it's really, in my view, much the same. So what was it about the coaching? How did he come at it that, that sort of stuck for you? I thought what was really, you know, it, at the time, all I remember was him yelling at me. <laughs> <laughs> So I, I don't know that I had as much perspective at 18 as I do now, but uh, you know, in thinking back about it, what, what strikes me is, is that the coach has a unique role. They're not playing, they're not scoring. Nobody puts in a box score after the game whether the coach had this many points or this, this. They don't have that. And in a way, that frees them then that their only goal is to do everything they can to make the team play well. Well, that's pretty good. That's really a lot of what I think the role of a CEO is. Uh, you know, I mean, I don't certainly win or lose every day. It's all the people, the colleagues I have at Crow that are out doing that. My job is simply to give them the tools, the resources, put them in the roles, give them the right environment that they can be successful. And 
My job is 100% to make other people successful. So I don't think of it as 3,600 people work for me. Yeah. I work for 3,600 people. That's really the way it is. And to me, that's what a coach is. And I think it starts with back then when they put a box score in the paper after the game, the coach isn't listed on there in terms of how many points he or she scored or anything like that. That frees them to really be 100% focused on how, how they can help everybody else on the team do do well. I love it. Just incidentally, if you didn't read this in, in Jim's biography, he and his dad are the only father and son uh, to, to ever have both been in the Indiana Basketball Hall of Fame. Oh. Isn't that amazing? So, wonderful. I think in my case, they, uh, they thought they were voting for my dad. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay, I take it. <laughs> Sometimes you win pretty, a lot of times you win ugly, but that's okay. <laughs> Don't mind it. You really couldn't miss being a Hoosier, right, to get into that Hall of Fame? Uh, yeah, it, it was certainly an environment where basketball was important, and my father being a coach. Uh, and just a little story there, my father played basketball in high school and college under John Wood, So, you know, he learned, and I, I, I uh, got to meet Coach Wooden many times as a kid growing up, and so my dad has a lot of the philosophies and thinking of John Wooden really embedded in him because he played as a <coughs> high school player and then in college, uh, both under John Wood. Could you share a little of those philosophies? You know, I think some of the philosophies that uh, he had were that, uh, you know, that it, it's all about, you know, preparing to win. A lot of people want to win. Most people want to win. Um, and many people have the ability to win. But on the other hand, not that many are necessarily focused on being prepared to win. Hmm. And so what Coach Wooden was was a real disciple of fundamentals, really doing the little things right, Every day, every time, doing little things right makes big things happen. And that's what my dad really stressed, too. They both were, you know, they'd go into, co into practices, they'd have note cards on very specific things that every day they wanted to make sure their team was getting better at the little details. There's a good story where Coach Wooden would start every season off by instructing his players how to put their socks on correctly <laughs> so that they didn't get blisters on their feet. But it's, you know, it's hard to imagine Kareem Abdul-Jabbar going through that when he played there, or Bill Walton. But I'm sure that they did. And uh, you know, those little things were what made the big things happen the right way. You know, before I get into that second question about your career, I, I, I think about being coached by your father. And I'm sure there's some men out here that have, uh, are coaching their children. Um, What's the pluses, and are there any minuses? Ah, well, uh, I'm trying to think. My my dad, the plus in hindsight was my dad was a very good coach, and I think my dad got the best out of me that I could I could be. So in that regard, I I love my dad because he was my dad, but he I love him because he was my coach too. He really did wonderful things for me. The negatives are that you know when your dad says something to you, you might sort of hear it in a different way than if somebody else says it to you. And so there were times, I could have been better yet, for sure, if I would have been able to ignore the fact that it was my dad criticizing me and that I didn't like that. And uh, you know, if I would have uh, maybe been able to tone my ego down just a little bit and listen a little better, I'm 100% certain I could have even been better. That's the negative is, is that when it comes from your father, it has a different, I'll say, feel to it than it does when it comes from somebody else. And you both have to recognize that and you know, own it, as they say, and, and you know, try, to do, try to make it the least restrictive that it can be and then build the most on the positives. But it, it can be a challenging situation for sure. In our pre-interview, I was really surprised when you mentioned that you didn't even want to be an accountant. No. <laughs> <laughs> Yet you lead the largest accounting program, and you get all those awards. What happened? How did you do that? 
understand. Well, you know, it's funny how life sometimes unfolds, and I'm sure it's true for many, many of you, that your path to where you get is often a winding one. And what it's taught me is, is don't be afraid when a door opens. If it looks good, you know, don't be afraid to follow it, even if it wasn't your plan, and that certainly was my case. I, was, uh, I went to DePauw University in Greencastle, Indiana. DePauw is a very, very good school. It has no accounting program. Uh, that, so I, I graduated from DePauw with a degree in economics. And so my career track was is that I was probably going to become a lawyer. Uh, I did not ultimately do that, and the reason was is that a friend of my family was uh, an individual by the name of Fred Crow, who had gone to school with my mother, and I'm sure what happened was is that year Crow probably fell short of their recruiting goals. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly before Julie Wood, our chief people officer, is here, before Julie would have had any involvement, uh, we we probably fell short of our recruiting goals, and so they invited me in in that spring and said, hey, you know, would you have interest in going to work for an accounting firm? And I thought to myself, geez, I don't know anything about accounting, but... Don't tell the people yeah. at home. <laughs> but on the other hand, you know, it probably will never hurt me to have experience at an accounting firm. Let's give it a try. And so I did. I went in and I tried it. I found that uh, I had a, you know, a bit of an aptitude for it. And what I really found was is that I loved the action and the numbers. You know, the, the, the way I would put it is, is that I found that if people could figure out the numbers and the money, so to speak, involved, then everything else sort of followed after that. I'm sure there's lawyers in here that uh, are very, very important in, to the work that their clients do, but I sort of did it simply that once we figured out the numbers, then we went and got the lawyers to come in and figure out how to get it down on paper. And I, I like the action and the numbers is sort of the way I looked at it. So I, I just stayed with it. Stayed with it. Yeah. When, when I was growing up, Jim, uh, my dad was a uh, politician and um, and sort of ingrained in us, this every one of us in our family, that we were we were also supposed to be leaders in the public world in some in some way. When did you develop a sense that you were a leader? Um, did you have an early sense of yeah, I'm supposed to do this, or I've been gifted for this? I mean, when when did the aha happen for you that you weren't just going to be a a, a a team member, but a, but a, a leader of a team? I don't know if there was ever one event, but in, in a way. The fact that I didn't have a lot of deep, deep knowledge in accounting, I think, helped me in that regard. So as a result, what I found was is that, you know, over time, I developed enough knowledge. I'm a, I've been a CPA now for 38 years, and I have good knowledge of accounting and those matters, but certainly others had a lot more. What I found, though, was is that pretty early in my career, short of being the smartest person in the room when it came to accounting. I, I rarely was that. Yeah. What I did find, though, was is that I could have impact on people. I found that you know I could convince people that they were capable of doing things. I could convince people that I was capable of helping them. That I could convince people that uh, you know what we were doing was really important. And, you know, I think all of those things, it wasn't like I was a great salesman, but I was able to articulate some of those things to people in ways that I saw help them rise and lift. And that's when I started to think, hey, there's something here. Because as a basketball player, you know, I, I, my goal was to score. Yeah. And, you know, I always make the comment that there are very, very few people in the Hall of Fame that were defensive specialists. <laughs> that's, that's usually not the traditional way to get into the Hall of Fame. Um, but I, I found in my professional career that it actually helped me in some ways that no one ever confused me for being the smartest accountant in the room. But what I found in my career was is I did have some ability to help people who were smarter really see themselves in ways that was 
positive and that allowed them to accomplish more. And then I found that, you know, that was actually more motivating to me than putting the ball in the basket myself. Can you give an example of that? Oh, no, I, you know, I try to do it every day. So, you know, I try to, I think people win first and foremost because they think they can. I've never met anybody who was good at something who thought they were lousy. But it's amazing how many people don't necessarily think they can win. Right. You know, they, they may say it if you ask them, do you think you can win? Right. Yes. Right. But then when you really get into it with them, they're not sure. They, they're, they're unsure, they're, they're afraid of the risk, they're afraid to take the risk. And so I try to do it every day and tell people that there's you know, very little downside to failing. In fact, there's lots of upside and that we, we try to actively work at creating an environment. We even have an award at Crow for the, the best failure of the year. And we do. We give people an award for the best fail, you know. That Damn, you win that. <laughs> <laughs> there are any openings. If your recruiting is low this year, I can see that. Tell, tell us more about that, though. Yeah. That sounds very dreamy. Well, we try to create a culture, you know, you mentioned we're an accounting firm, for sure. We are an accounting firm. We do audit and tax work, just like every other accounting firm you would know. We're a consulting firm. Um, so we do all sorts of consulting projects, helping people improve their performance and comply with regulatory compliance and manage their risks and all of the things that consultants do. Then in addition, we're a technology business. And if you think about that, in a technology business, you know, I mean, you're trying things all the time. And many, many of them are going to fail, but the old adage in technology is, is fail fast but fall forward. <laughs> and that's what we try to do. So we try to promote that culture. And I'll tell you, among 3,600 people, many of whom have backgrounds in, in accounting and finance and all of those areas, those are not people that necessarily feel real good about failure. They don't feel real good as a result about taking risks. And, you know, I think in business, you get very little if you take no risk. In fact, in a lot of ways, you get nothing if you take no risk. So that's a shift in mindset that's uh, something that we try, back to your question, I, I'd be hesitant to cite one example because we try to do it every day in every way we can to promote that feeling that uh, we're going to win. Uh, you're going to win. We've got confidence in you. And then when you don't win, we're going to be there to help you back up and dust you off and push you forward. And we find that that has a very positive impact on what people not only believe they can do, but what they can, what they actually end up accomplishing. We could imagine, I think, a number of the organizations represented in this room instituting that idea of you know, the best failure of, of the year. Tell us a little bit more about the, how you how you leverage that idea. Are you, when you when you identify somebody who's a candidate for this auspicious award, uh, is it is it is it a conversation about what's been learned, what's yeah. been gained by the process of? of That's really what we try to focus on. Is is that maybe their initial idea didn't work? Yeah. But if it led to new discoveries, new ideas, ideas that did work, that's a great failure. And I think what you would find, and, and you know, if you had the opportunity to talk to other technology people, what many of you would probably know in your own businesses, that a lot of the best successes we have were not a straight line. They started as something, you know, they, they worked, they didn't work, they kind of evolved and they changed, and that's how you know new value is really almost always created. And what I've found is generally accountants don't feel real comfortable with that path. They like straight lines and <laughs> rise at 6% per year. And, and, and they, they do, and who doesn't? But on the other hand, it's okay if it's got some ups and downs because that's really the way she works most of the time. How did they take that though? I was thinking, you know, accountants have their gifts, but they aren't, they're not as flexible. And you're talking about risks and ups and downs and my gosh, what do you want out of those poor people? <laughs> we want them to feel good.
good at taking <laughs> risks. But, you know, the key thing with risks is, is that when you take them, you have to accept that there's going to be failures. The key is fail fast. If it's not going to work, the quicker we can come to that conclusion, the better. I like failure. That's the key thing. Uh, the worst thing is, is a slow failure. No, oh, what's a fast failure? You know, what we try to do is if people have ideas, we try to put it through an initial sort of market validation, we call it. You know, okay, so you got an idea, is there a market for it? Would anybody actually buy that if we had it? So we get our marketing people involved to help with that, and then, you know, if, if that passes, then we go through different other gates along the way. Every step along the way, it's pass-fail. And, you know, that's not unique to Crow, but that is kind of the way the technology world works, and that's why, as I said, we try to embrace the idea we're an accounting and consulting firm, like many, many of the firms that you all would know. Maybe one of the things that's different at Crow is, is we're also very, very much a technology firm, not in the sense we just use technology, but we try to think like a technology business and manage like a technology business. Oh, that's excellent. You, um Talk to me about probably one of your hardest decisions were when you were offered the CEO job in Indianapolis, and this was going to make a, a difference in your family's lives uh, moving there. And I, it brought me back to when my husband was moving up the corporate ladder at McDonald's, and um, we ended up moving three times in three years doing some of that. But in the first one, in the first move, um, he took me away from him, <laughs> sad. He took me away from my family and my friends and everybody, and um, it was very depressing for me, and I had three little ones. And then the most depressing part was after we were there about four months, he came to me and he said, I don't like this job. <laughs> <laughs> uh, really? <laughs> Well, you know, I moved to Indianapolis uh, before I became CEO, but I'm certain I, I would have never had the opportunity to be our CEO. I grew up in Elkhart. I mentioned that in uh, Elkhart, Indiana, so I went to high school there, went away to college, and then I came back and went to work for Crow in northern Indiana. And so I, I worked for Crow for a long time in northern Indiana. And at age 51, um, you know, I sort of thought that, uh, you know, there wasn't a lot more runway for me in northern Indiana. Whatever I was going to accomplish there, I'd probably accomplish. <coughs> Certainly, no need to do anything different, but I, I didn't see a lot of upside. So I was presented an opportunity to uh, take a national leadership role with Crow at that time, but you couldn't do it from Elkhart. I mean, you know, you just couldn't do it from Elkhart too hard to travel, and when you're sitting in New York and somebody says, where are you from? And you say, Elkhart. <laughs> what? <laughs> so uh, I moved to Indianapolis at that time, and you know, my wife had grown up her entire life. Our kids had gone to high school in Elkhart. Our, my parents lived in Elkhart. At that time, her parents lived in Elkhart. Her sisters lived in Elkhart. <laughs> So, yeah, it was, uh, it was a big step, but uh, not unlike your story with uh, your husband with just a little different ending, you know, after we moved, it was very traumatic in a way for her, we moved, and after about six months, she came to me and she said, hey, how's this working out for you down here? And I said, that's eh, different, but I think it's going to be okay. She said, well, that's good. Because I'm not going back. <laughs> <laughs> so she literally burned the ships. <laughs> Just to add okay. on, and tell them what your term is as uh, CEO. I thought that was interesting. You know, at, at Crow, currently we have uh, a four year term as CEO, and uh, you can do two terms of, of four years, and then you're done. 
We do not believe in an institutional anything at that point. And I think that's really good. I'd actually, I've actually suggested to our board that I, I think eight years might be a little long. Yeah. Not in the sense that it, uh, you know, that I would lose enthusiasm quicker than that. But I think it's, you know, there's a need for change. And, you know, I, I've heard people say that after, a, you know, a certain period of time, you just need a new voice, a new direction, a new energy. And it doesn't mean that anybody was bad in the old role, but that's our model, and it's worked pretty well for us, is, is that we have never had a CEO, really, in our modern times that has been in the role for more than eight years, and I'd actually encourage it. I, frankly, myself, I don't plan to stay in it for eight years, even if they allow me to. I, I just think it's too long. How long are you in now? I've been in uh, three years now. I've heard some members of the club encouraging term limits for you and me. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I think it makes sense. I think it does. I, you know, we, we have that with our president, obviously. And, um, you know, I think getting transition and new, new roles, new views, new leadership, at least in our organization, that has been a very positive thing for us. Mm -hmm. Good, good. So I wanted to push it into the, this whole value of failure thing for a moment. So I, think, I think that all of us uh, like the, the idea philosophically, but it's awfully hard to actually live, live with that. Uh, um, tell us about a time in your life when you feel like, as you look back, you lacked the courage or the resolve or something else that you should have brought to that circumstance. Uh, in other words, in a sense, you failed the moment and then what you learned from that. Yeah. You know, I can think back on lots of failures, as I'm sure all of us in, in a way can, but uh, one sticks out a little bit in my mind. I was, you know, given a position of leadership, and, and one of the key things that a leader does is they have to put people in the positions that are going to, you know, be the very best to help you as the leader accomplish what you want to do. And, you know, I, I put one person in particular into a leadership role a number of years ago when I had that responsibility that, to be honest, I didn't think was probably very good. But everybody kind of thought that was the person that should be in that role. Mm -hmm. Sort of like by acclaim, man, well, of course, that person's going to be in that role. I had misgivings, but I didn't have the courage at that point to say, we're going to go a different direction. And, you know, I think in hindsight, I think that was a, really a poor decision on my part. And I've challenged myself afterwards that, uh, you know, you, you really have to have the courage of your convictions. If you believe strongly that something is not right, even if everybody around you thinks it is, I think you've got to say, but I'm not going to do that. Yeah. And I didn't have that courage then. Uh, and that taught me a lesson that I think has been very valuable to me as I've moved into the role I have now, that I, you know, we had, we had uh, five lines of business when I came in, and I changed, I changed the leadership in four. Mm. And now, does that make me smart by doing that? I, I, no, we'll see. Uh, but on the other hand, I, those were the people that I thought were the best ones for that role. And I wasn't going to just go along with what everybody kind of thought was <laughs> the right person, which I had done before and it proved to be a wrong move. What kind of personality would that have shown? Would, would it be more you wanted to be liked back then or no? Yeah, I'm sure part of it is, is wanting to be liked, but it's also part of it is maybe not having the uh, confidence to think that maybe you know Okay. Uh, and so it's easier to go along with what everybody believes. You know, by acclamation, this is the right move. Well, okay, then I'll go along with it too. I'm, you know, I, I just have found since then that uh, nothing wrong with agreeing with that if you really agree. Mm -hmm. But if you don't, you should, you should have the courage to step forward and say, no, that isn't the right move, even if, even if it's an unpopular stance. You make a reference to Peyton Manning's quote. Um, and yeah. you, you bring that into leadership. 
Yeah, I, I got to know Peyton a little bit when he was in Indianapolis. He and I were members of, a, of the same golf club. His locker, actually, as it turned out, was right next to mine. So it was nice. It, you know, he, uh, he liked to play golf. And uh, he probably thought he was a little better at golf than, than he was. <laughs> <laughs> he was. He was a lot better at football. Than he was. But, uh, anyways, Peyton has a great quote that I really think, you know, he's he won four or five most valuable players and wow. obviously he was a terrific, terrific football player. But a quote he he makes often now is is that the most valuable player is the one who makes the most players valuable. And if you think about it, that's really right. It's not the person that scores the most points. It's not the smartest person in the room and all the things that we would normally attribute to being the most valuable player. Mm -hmm. His point is, is the most valuable player is the one that makes the most other people valuable. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really insightful and I try to remember that uh, and share that with uh, our team at Crow all the time because I really believe that's, that's uh, that'll work. Just that'll work anywhere. One quick question. Where do you go after eight years? <laughs> CEO, yeah. I mean, you know, yeah. what do you do then? You're young. You want to come over here? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. I, you know, I don't. I don't know. I'll, I'll be okay, though. I'll be fine. <laughs> you know, I, I don't know. Uh, in the past, some of our CEOs have gone on and done special project work. Some of them have retired. We have an international group that uh, has people all over the world. Our, the CEO that I followed is today the co-chair of our international network. So there's there's lots of good roles that'll Great. occupy me very well, including maybe playing golf yeah. <laughs> in December someplace. <laughs> maybe not over here at Butler, but uh, someday. Good. Are there other things about uh, leadership that you know now that maybe you didn't know be before um, that you, know, you just feel like if you, if you had a chance to drill into other rising leaders, um, one or two really important things that maybe people could miss. Yeah. What else comes to your mind? Well, it's just my own experience. I mentioned to you earlier that early in my career, you know, my whole focus was me. You know, so score the most points. Mm -hmm. you know, get the most new accounts. Uh, generate the most revenue. It was, it was a bit too much focused on me. If I could share anything, I was asked this question, if I could go back 25 years and give myself some advice, what would it be? It would be, you know, listen more, talk less, and, uh, you know, that would be the advice. Hey, if you're smart, people are going to recognize it. Don't worry about it. You don't need to tell them about it. What can you learn from them? And I didn't do enough of that when I was younger, and, and so as a leadership advice as a leadership uh, sort of tool, I would sell, tell people, hard to learn while you're talking. <laughs> so try to listen really well to the people around you and then, uh, you know, then go try to put it in action. So if I had anything to do all over, give myself more advice or advice from 20 years ago, it would be listen, listen a fair bit more and not be so focused on telling people about you. <laughs> And I, I would think, though, in, in the sport team, was it really about you? I mean, yeah, I mean we, we sort of did. my role was to score points. Oh, okay. And you know, <laughs> I, so I, I yeah. yeah, that was my role on the team. So I was right. a good team player. There's, right. I, mean, I used to tell people, hey, I'm going to pass to you a lot, but here's how I'm going to do it. I'm going to shoot, and probably only half of them are going to go in. <laughs> so feel free to rebound any of the other ones. <laughs> you know, in I'm your, teasing. In your, in, your introduction, in your introduction, I loved how um, women like your company. And in this day and age, it's good that they do. And um, how, why and how do they like it? <laughs> Well, first I'd say that uh, I think women have, have uh, a lot of interest and aptitude in finance and in numbers. They're, they're very good at it. Lots of people, lots of women go into it. If you look at the 
schools we recruit at, probably half of the people that are there are women. And to be honest, if you looked at the very top students at many of those schools, it's more than half of them are women. So I think they have good aptitude for it. But secondly, I also think women have the capability, and I've seen this in my wife and in my daughters, and ho hopefully one day see it in my granddaughter. You know, women, I think, in a way, are wired to think the way I described. They, they help other people. They, they're, they have it hardwired in themselves to help other people be successful. Children, parents, friends, on and on. And, they, and they, my wife is just incredible. Well, that translates into you know, high potential for success in any business, and particularly our business. What we have to do, though, is, is that we have structurally some things that get in the way of women succeeding long term at Crow, at any business. We have unconscious biases that restrict their ability to, you know, to become as successful as they could be. And to be honest, we all lose when we let those things continue. So let's don't let them continue. So let's really work on unconscious bias. It's what, hard. What would be an unconscious bias? Well, I mean, we're all naturally attracted to people that are like us. So what happens? So when I was young, <coughs> you know, hey, let's go play golf with this uh, with these bankers in town. Right. Well, what if I'd have been a woman? Would they have taken me? I don't think so. Mm -hmm. Or let's go out for a drink afterwards <coughs> at the club. You I mean, all that's business. That's how business works. And if we're excluding people because they're just not like us. Right. And they don't fit in quite as easy. Or let's go talk to them. They take me to visit with clients. I didn't have anything to say when I was young. If I'd have been a woman, would they have taken? I'm not sure. No. So it's those unconscious, like me, biases that get in people's way. And then in addition, we were just structurally losing way too many women in our process at Crow because of you know the. the wanted to raise children, they wanted to, they, had, they needed more flexibility than maybe our traditional model could provide. So with the help of, of many here, and Mary Ann Travers is here, who leads our Women Leading in Crow program at Crow. Uh, stand up, Mary Ann. So there we go. We uh, really tried to dismantle as many of those structural impediments as we could. So. For example, at Crow, we have a policy called, uh, uh, you know, work, work where you need to work. What? You know, so if that means that today you've got to be, you know, remote because your kids are doing this or right. your, or your, you know, your child's sick or something like that, that's fine. Yeah. Just get it done from wherever you are getting it done, and we we allow people that flexibility. I think it's created good opportunities oh, for men yeah. and women, yeah. but I mean, some of those structural impediments have a disproportionate impact, I would say, on women, and we just can't have that. No. Not when half of, the, of our, the only product we have are people. If half of them are gonna have structural impediments mm -hmm. that somehow are gonna knock too many of them out of our, boy, we are a loser, they're a loser, we're a loser, our clients are a loser, we don't want to play loser games. No. So we've tried to eliminate as many of those as we can and then really work back on this, this unconscious bias, which we all have. Bias sounds like an evil word. It's how we deal with the world we're in. You know, you, you have biases, you see things, and you react a certain way, and you don't even know it. But it's gotten it's, better. It's getting better, oh, but there's still yeah. lots more that we can do in that regard. Right. Because I think of my career and you know, I, as I said earlier, I didn't have much, there was no one least, there was, I was the least likely person ever to be successful in my career probably that ever came to it. Well, how did I be successful? Lots of people helped me. Well, if I'd have been a woman or if I'd have been of color or if I'd been, you know, I, I would just fear that not that anybody consciously would have said, hey, let's ignore him or her. 
but unconsciously it would have been a it would have been a it would have been a hill to climb. Mm -hmm. It really would have. We got to eliminate that as much as we in, possibly in, can. In light of the the news we talked about at the start of today, of just all that's going on with with revelations of sexual harassment, uh, I, I think of uh, of the comment that uh, Matt Lauer's uh, co-anchor made uh, earlier this week that we're in sort of a season of reckoning. And reckoning it implies always, in one sense, accountability uh, for past failures. Uh, but it also implies, at least in sailor's language, navigation of the future. It's a reckoning towards where, where we need to go. As a leader of a major enterprise that uh, has men and women in the workplace and dealing with all these kinds of things, are there particular ingredients, you think, to creating a organizational culture that will minimize the amount of harassment and abuse of the kind that we're seeing? What, what, what kicks up for you as, you as you think about that topic today? Yeah, it's, I'm sure, a topic that uh, many boardrooms are probably having discussions on today, and, and at least thoughtfully, they sure should be. So uh, our chief people officer is here, Julie Wood, and Julie and I are talking about it all the time. And so I think there's a couple of things you can do. You know, you can certainly have harassment training. I mean, and, you know, we, we do. We have a lot of that, and we take it very seriously. We certainly have a, a values hotline so that people can anonymously report things that they see or hear. So I think that's another good thing that we have. But maybe the most important thing is, is that culturally, you know, we really have strong culture, I think, at Crow that's built around the concept of we care about one another. And we, we stress it's care, share, invest, and grow. You know, when, when those issues arise, they are dealt with harshly, and I think that is part of the culture. So those are the, you know, the preventative measures and, you know, that we, we have in place, and we want to augment them every way we can, but, uh, you know, unfortunately, I, a lot of the things we see are a bit of a reflection of our, of our society in general today, and that's... That's unfortunate, and I think your comments to start off with were really good, and we ought to be all reflective about it. Thankfully, we haven't had many issues in that regard, but uh, we should be reflective of the fact that it's clearly still a big problem and that we need to probably do more than we're even doing today. In spite of the fact that we haven't had many problems and quote unquote we would be a success in that regard maybe today, that's probably not good enough for tomorrow. So. Julie and I are having ongoing dialogue about how we, we can build further the culture of Crow, that it's an environment that everyone can feel comfortable in and that harassment's not tolerated in any way, shape, or form. We have a lot of, you know, we have a lot of different groups at Crow that you know, we have women, we have Latinos, we have Asian Americans, we have African Americans, we have people of different orientations, we have all of those people, and I want every one of them to feel like their opportunities at Crow are absolutely unlimited. Because we welcome that. You know, we, want a, we want an inclusive environment that completely, uh, completely uh, you know, disavows any aspect of harassment mm -hmm. and, uh, in, on any term. It is a special time, too, for the courage of women. And I think that's what's important and what's happening. And uh, my hat's off to all these women. Uh, tell us, finally, the constant message that you deliver in your corporate strategy. Well, if I could, I'd, I'd probably say two things. I'd, I'd answer with two things. One is, is that I think values matter you know so you see values up on plaques and rooms and in hallways and so forth and you know if that's all it is it, it's kind of nice but it doesn't matter at crow values matter i think we're successful more successful as an organization because we have strong values so i try to at every at every meeting i'm at at every turn i try to stress 
our values, care, share, invest, and grow. That's why Crow has been successful. We're celebrating our 75th anniversary wow. this year. Wow. To me, that is fundamental to who we are and why we're successful. Yeah. And I try to really stress that. Values matter. They aren't just window dressing that sounds good. They do matter. And then secondly, you know, we're going to win. And we're going to win for some very specific reasons. So here's what you need to do to really get in and, and help us win. And I think with, with the anchoring and the values and then a, hopefully a pretty specific strategy on how we're going to win at Crow versus our competitors, many of whom who have hundreds of times the resources we have, how do you win? Well, we've got some pretty specific ideas on how we win. And I, those are the things I try to stress. To There's one, though, you're forgetting <laughs> in our interview. Yeah. It begins with F, U, N. Oh, yes, you're right. And we're going to have fun yeah. doing it. <laughs> yes, you're exactly right. We're going to have fun See doing it. See how good I am? Well, I was <laughs> 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 